the premise of this book is that sticky ideas share a set of common traits. And these traits, they've come up with a mnemonic device that you can remember them by. It's the word success without the final S. Simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and stories. So we all need to know what's going to resonate, what's going to connect with our audience. Well, if it is so simple, why aren't we inundated with sticky ideas? It's not like there's a powerful constituency for overcomplicated, lifeless prose. Um, but there's a reason this is so difficult for most of us to do. Turns out there's a natural villain here, and it's a tendency that consistently confounds our ability to create ideas using these principles, and it's called the curse of knowledge. And Chip and Dan Heath believe it's so important that they capitalize this throughout the book. Um, curse, capital C, of knowledge, capital K. And so basically that just means that once you've learned something, it's hard to unlearn it. It's hard to go back to being, to remembering what it was like to not know that. And they give an excellent story that illustrates this called The Tappers versus the Listeners. And I'm just going to read from the book right now. I've put it into my notes, but I'm reading from the book. In 1990, Elizabeth Newton earned a PhD in psychology at Stanford by studying a simple game in which she assigned people to one of two roles, tappers and listeners. Tappers received a list of 25 well-known songs, such as Happy Birthday to You and The Star-Spangled Banner. Each tapper was asked to pick a song and tap out the rhythm to a listener by knocking on a table. The listener's job was to guess the song based on the rhythm being tapped. The listener's job is quite difficult. Over the course of Newton's experiment, 120 songs were tapped out. Listeners guessed only 2.5% of the songs. That's three out of 120. But here's what made the result worthy of a dissertation in psychology. Before the listeners guessed the name of the song, Newton asked the tappers to predict the odds that the listeners would guess correctly. They predicted that the odds were 50%, so one in two. The tappers got their message across one time in 40, but they thought they were getting it across one time in two. Why? When a listener taps, she's hearing the song in her head. Meanwhile, did I say listener? When a tapper taps, she's hearing the song in, the head, in her head. Meanwhile, the listeners can't hear that tune. To them, all they hear is a bunch of disconnected taps, like a kind of bizarre Morse code. And in the experiment, tappers are flabbergasted at how hard the listeners seem to be working to pick up the tune. Isn't the song obvious? The tapper's expressions when a listener guesses happy birthday to you for the Star Spangled Banner are priceless. How could you be so stupid? Okay, so happy birthday to you. And the Star Spangled Banner. You see, but when you, when you hear it in your head, it's like, oh, come on, can't you get it? Star Spangled Banner. And yet, that's how we all are with our own messages, because we know them so well. And we just assume that our audience knows it well as well. So the problem is that the tappers have been given knowledge that makes it impossible for them to imagine what it's like to lack that knowledge. When they're tapping, they can't imagine what it's like for the listeners to hear isolated taps rather than a song. And I have a story from my own experience. When I was in my 20s, my younger brother Mark um, it was one Christmas. He gave me and my parents the gift of ski lessons. He was going to teach us how to ski. This was in Ohio. Not a lot of ski slopes there, but nonetheless. And so he took us out. It was me and my parents and gave me the basic pointers. You know, bend your legs and lean forward. And here's what you do with your ski poles. And got on the chairlift and all. But he had forgotten to tell me what you do when the chairlift gets to the top of the mountain. <laughs> and I somehow thought that I was just going to be, the chairlift would set me up, down, and I would just ski off. Well, I didn't realize you have to stand up and you have to ski off the lift. So I got up there, the chairlift was going up and around, I was like, oh crap, and I just leapt off and wound up in a heap in the snow, and um, it was a big disaster, they had to stop the lift, and <laughs> it was embarrassing, and, and my brother was like, Oh, wow, I forgot what it's like to not even know the basics of skiing. And yet that's what we're all like in our own areas of expertise. The French 
Aviator and author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry gave this definition of engineering elegance. A designer knows he has achieved perfection, not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. So there's always a tendency among us to gravitate towards complexity, and especially in our areas of expertise, and that is always at war with the need to prioritize. Um, and the authors did this great experiment, or they cite a great experiment, about how uncertainty, even irrelevant uncertainty, can paralyze us. And this is why prioritization is so important. So in the experiment, they gave students a choice of, do you want to go to a lecture by a real interesting person that you admire or study in the library? Well, obviously, given this choice, the students said, I'll go see the lecture. Then they added another thing. Do you want to go see uh, a lecture by someone you really admire, a movie, actually it was a foreign film, or study in the library? Well, given that many choices, paradoxically, students chose to study. And that was because uncertainty, they said, even irrelevant uncertainty, causes us to be paralyzed. Like if you're standing in the supermarket in front of 60 different kinds of breakfast cereal. I know for me that's difficult. Um, so prioritization rescues people from the quicksand of decision angst. And that's why finding the core is so important. And really, so what we're going for with our simple ideas that are core and compact, the model of that is a proverb. Cervantes said, proverbs are short sentences drawn from long experience. For example, a stitch in time saves nine a leopard cannot change its spots. All that glitters is not gold. And once you find the core, then you need to communicate that core. And again, when you communicate it, you're giving a little information, and then a little more, and then a little more. And it's kind of like flirting. You're just giving the information out bit by bit, just as much as they need to know. It turns out that naturally sticky ideas are full of concrete ideas. Our brains are wired to remember concrete ideas. And in Proverbs, we see that also. Abstract truths are often encoded in concrete language. A bird in hand is worth two in the bush. And another thing about concrete ideas is it's a way to ensure that our idea, our idea will mean the same thing to everyone in our audience. Um, they give, the authors give another great example of being concrete. And so this is the story of Jerry Kaplan. The year is 1987. It's in Silicon Valley. You have this bright young guy, 29-year-old Jerry Kaplan. He has an idea for a laptop computer, revolutionary at the time. He's trying to get funding from some venture capitalists. And so he's going to a pitch session. And he realizes, he gets there, and he sees, he's standing at the doorway watching the presentation of the previous guy, all dressed up in a pinstripe suit, got his PowerPoint going, and the venture capitalist guys are peppering him with questions. Jerry's going, oh, crap. I didn't, I didn't dress appropriately. I don't even have a PowerPoint. All he had, all he had was a leather portfolio, like this. He's like, OK, I guess I've, I've lost it all at this point. So he goes in takes his leather portfolio, pitches it on the table, sails down, and he says, gentlemen, you're looking at the future of computing. At this point, I just have to read from the book. All right, gentlemen, here's a model of the next step in the computer revolution. For a moment, I thought this final act of drama might get me thrown out of the room. They were sitting in stunned silence, staring at my plain leather folder, which lay motionless on the table as though it were suddenly going to come to life. Brooke Byers, the youthful-looking but longtime partner in the firm, slowly reached out and touched the portfolio as if it were some sort of talisman. He asked the first question. Just how much information could you put in something like that? John Doerr, another partner, answered before I could respond. Doesn't matter. Memory chips are getting smaller and cheaper each year, and the capacity will probably double for the same size and price annually. Someone else chimed in. But bear in mind, John, that unless you translate the handwriting efficiently, it's likely to take up a lot more room. The speaker was Vinod Kosla, the founding CEO of Sun Microsystems, who helped the partnership evaluate technology deals. Well, at that point, what ensued was an animated conversation back and forth, people picking up the leather portfolio, 
imagining it as a laptop computer, and Jerry wound up getting $4.5 million in funding for his project. And it was all because he was able to make his idea concrete. Concreteness is so powerful, though. Why do we so easily slip into abstraction? It's because the difference between an expert and a novice is the ability to think abstractly. And because experts are capable of seeing a higher level of insight and complexity, they, that is we, all want to talk on that higher level. We want to talk about chess strategies and not about bishops moving diagonally. And so it's always a challenge for us to remember that, to, to not go for the abstract, but to think concretely. And concreteness, luckily enough, is one of the easiest of these traits to remember. How do we get people to care about our ideas? We make them feel something. Research shows that people are more likely to make a charitable gift to a single needy individual than to an entire impoverished region. We're wired to feel things for people, not for abstractions. And finally, tell a story. People remember stories. They don't remember facts or logical expl explanations. If you want to get your point across, if you want to be remembered, tell a story. And so just to sum up again, sticky ideas share a set of common traits. These are traits that can be learned. Um, we need to watch out for the curse of knowledge, which is when we know so much about our subject and we assume that our audience does too. Be simple, be concrete, and be emotional. And finally, I highly recommend reading this book, Made to Stick. It will change how you think about communication.